Hello, welcome to uh, the continuation of session three. Um, in this session, we're looking at part two, where we present numerical summary measures, but this time looking at uh, measures of dispersion. Uh, we just looked at um, um, central tendencies such as average, which locates the center of the data, but it's also important to know how the data is spread out. That is, what measures of dispersion tell us? That is what they tell us, the spread in the, uh, the data. In this session, we will illustrate how to compute various measures of dispersion. At the end of the session, the student will be able to compute and interpret the range, variance, and standard deviation from grouped data as well as ungrouped data. The student will be able to compute and interpret what is termed the coefficient of variation, also compute percentiles, quartiles, and deciles, and be able to compute and interpret the interquartile range as well as describe the data set in terms of its skewness, that is departure from symmetry. So we have structured the session under the following topics. Measures of dispersion for ungrouped data, measures of dispersion for group data, and then other measures of dispersion. Let's begin with measures of dispersion for ungrouped data. As I indicated earlier, we are also interested in the spread of the data and not just where it is centered. And our first measure of this, uh, dispersion that we'll look at is the range. The range is the simplest measure and it is simply calculated as the difference between the highest value and the lowest value in the data set. So it looks at how data is spread out. For example, consider the uh, CON214 interim assessment uh, results for the second semester of 2014-2015. Now, the highest mark was 29 out of 30, and the lowest mark was 2. Therefore, the range is 29 minus 2, which is 27, which indicates a very wide spread in the data set. We can also look at the population variance. And the population variance is denoted sigma, as you can see. And it is equal to the arithmetic mean of the squared deviations from the population mean. So what it means is that for each of the observations in the data, you take from it the mean computed from the data you square it, sum the square deviations, and then divide by n. So first, take each observation, subtract from it the mean of the entire data set, square the result, sum the square deviations, and divide by n. So we can illustrate this. Let's say the ages of the Aproni family are 2. 18, 34, and 42 years. And we want to find out the variance, which is the population variance. What we need to do first is to calculate the mean. And we know the mean is summation x over n. So we sum all the x's. That is 2 plus 18 plus 34 plus 42 divided by 4, which gives us 24. Now we obtain the deviations from the mean or the squared deviations from the mean as follows. It is 2 minus 24 squared, 18 minus 24 squared, 34 minus 24 squared, and then 42 minus 24 squared. You sum all these and divide by n, which is 4, and it gives you 236. Now, for computational e, sometimes the variance formula is simplified this way. In other words, from the previous formula, 
it can be shown that the variance is also equal to summation x squared over n minus summation x over n all squared, which is the same as the mean. So you can also write it as summation x squared over n minus the square of the mean. It gives you the same answer. Now, when you obtain the variance, it is an easy step to obtain the standard deviation because the standard deviation is simply the square root of the population variance. So, having obtained our variance as 236, we just take its square root and we have 15.36. It tells you that on average, each of the observations are about 15.36 units, in this case, yes, away from the mean. Each of them, on average, are spread away from the mean by that magnitude. We can also compute the variance for the, um, uh, the sample, that is a sample variance. And the sample variance is denoted by S, so S squared, and it's the same approach. It is the arithmetic mean of the square deviations from the mean. But this time, the difference is that the denominator is n minus 1 instead of using n. Now, the reason being that the sample variance is an estimate of the population variance. But it is observed that the distribution in the sample data is much smaller than in the entire population. So if we use n as a denominator, we will over, we'll bias the results. So to compensate for that, we divide by n minus 1, so as to obtain what we, we call an unbiased estimate of the population variance. So this is the formula you apply. You can use this one or that. It gives you the same result. So as an example, the previous, um, um, the, for example, this data is a sample of five hourly wages for various jobs on a university campus. Okay, this is what people are paid. We can find the variance, but first we need to find the sample uh, mean, which is 7.4, and then we compute the variance applying the formula we just learned, and it gives us 5.3 we obtain the standard deviation as the square root of the variance, which is 2.3. So again, the 2.3 tells us that on average, the hourly wages differ by $2.3 or CDs or Naira, whatever monetary unit you are using. Now let's move on to measures of dispersion for group data. Essentially, the same formula is applied the only difference is that in this case, since it's group data, the x you see here is not an individual observation, but the midpoint. And since there are quite a number of observations in that class, we weight it by the frequency. So the sample variance for group data is, you, is computed using this uh, formula where we have square deviations from the mean multiplied by the frequency for each class divided by n minus 1. Alternatively, you can apply this formula which gives you the same answer. And as I indicated, the axis indicate the class midpoint and then the f, the class frequency. So in your problem set, you will get questions that you will be able to illustrate how to compute these. And again, the sample standard deviation is simply the square root of the sample variance. Next, we talk about other measures, the other measures of dispersion. And the first of it is what we call the coefficient of variation. The coefficient of variation that we denote as CV is simply the sample standard deviation divided by the sample mean, multiplied by 100. Now, the coefficient of variation is used so we can compare dispersion in two sets of data. It could be that the data are measured in different units, maybe 
you measure income in cities, and you me measure education in number of years. So you want to look at whether the dispersion differs between the incomes of people and the education they've obtained. So because education is in years and income is in cities, you cannot compare because we are comparing apples to oranges. We want to compare apples to apples. So what we do is to use this formula which makes the results unitless, right? Because standard deviation in cities divided by sample mean in cities, the cities cancel out. And then when you use the education and it's in years, standard deviation in years divided by mean years of education, the years cancel out. So this measure becomes unitless. But another way is where it is even in this, the measurements are in the same units, but they are wide apart. Looking at variation among people who are very well paid and then income among those who are poorly paid. So we want to compare whether there's greater variation. So basically, that's what it tells us. It allows us to compare uh, the variation or dispersion across two data sets. So as an example, let's say that a study of the test scores in management principles and the years of service of employees enrolled in the course resulted in the following statistics. One, the mean test score is 200 with a standard deviation of 40. The mean years of service is 20 years with a standard deviation of five years. So we can compute the coefficient of variation for test scores, which gives us 20%, and then the coefficient of variation for years of service, which is 25%. Now, if you had just looked at the data, the standard deviation as it was 40 and five, you would have said that there was higher variation in test scores compared to um, um, mean years of service because the standard deviation there was 40 against 5. But by making the measures unitless, by deflating the standard deviation by the sample mean, we've, we've seen a higher percentage for years of service, which actually says that there's greater dispersion in the years of service compared to the mean scores. Other um, measures of dispersion, uh, dispersion we can look at are percentiles, quartiles, and deciles. Now, you recall that we discussed the mean, and we said it is uh, the value that divides the data into two halves, right? So we can use that same technique to discuss percentiles. Now, we, when we, we into two equal halves, now, so it is the value such that 50% of observations are below and 50% above. Now, when we talk about percentiles, it basically looks at dividing observations into 100 equal parts. So a percentile will be a value such that P% percent of the observations are below this value and 100 minus P% percent are above this value. It is similar to the mean because in the mean, me, sorry, median, we said the median is a value such that 50% are below it and 50% are above it. But if we're not just talking about the median, which is 50%, but we say a P percentile, then we're saying that a P means, percentile means that P percent are below that value and 100 minus P percent are above it. So, for example, when we talk about the 10th percentile, then we are looking for the value in the data such that 10% of observations are below it, and then 90%, which is 100 minus 10, right, um, above it. So, we can apply the formula we saw for uh, median earlier to locate the position of the percentile. So, we said that we could use the formula n plus 1 divided by 2, which gives us the location of the uh, median. But we can write that formula again as n plus 1 times, sorry, n plus 1 times p divided by 100. And because we know the median is the 50th percentile, in place of the p, we put 50. And when we put the 50 there, we get back our formula, 
right? N plus 1 over 2. Because 50 over 100 is 1 over 2. 1 over 2 or half multiplied by N plus 1 gives us N plus 1 over 2. So this gives us a, form, a general formula to locate the position of a particular percentile. So to find the percentile's position, we use this formula, N plus 1 times P over 100. So consider this data set arranged in ascending order. And of course, to do that, you need to arrange the data in ascending order to calculate percentiles or median. So it's 37 up to 96. And I think there are 12 values in all. So if we want to compute the 25th percentile, then the formula, according to the formula, it should be 12 plus 1, because our n is 12, multiplied by 25 divided by 100. When you evaluate this, it gives you 3.2, right? Because 12 plus 1 is 13, and multiplied by 1 over 4, it gives you 13 over 4, and it is 3.25. How do you interpret 3.25? What it means is that the 25th percentile is a quarter of the distance between the third and the fourth observations because 0.25 is a quarter. Or you can also say it is 25% of the distance between the third and the fourth observation. So how do we obtain that value? It means that you take the third observation, which is 71, add to it 0 0.25 of the distance between the fourth and the third observation, which is 75 minus 71, right? So you evaluate that as 71 plus 0 0.25 times 4. It gives us 72. So our 25th percentile is 72. What is the interpretation? It means that in the data set that we have, 25% of the observations are less than 72 or they are, at, it are less than 72 and 75 percent of the observations are greater than 72. now we can apply that principle to find quartiles but you know quarter quart or quartile means four so quartiles divide a set of observations into four equal parts so it means that we need to have three quartiles the first quartile which is the same as the 25th percentile the second quartile, which is the same as the 50th percentile or the median, and then we can also talk about the third quartile, which is the 75th percentile. So to find a first quartile, we just compute the 25th percentile. So the formula we saw earlier is applied. Similarly for deciles, deciles divide a set of observations or data set into 10 equal parts. So we have nine deciles. The first decile is the same as the 10th percentile. And then the fifth decile is the same as the 50th percentile, or the median. So in the same vein, each data set has 99 percentiles, thus div dividing the data set into 100 equal parts. The percentile formula described um, on the previous slide is applied in calculating quartiles as well as deciles. So assuming we wanted to compute the 90th percentile, which would be the ninth decile, which is the same thing as the ninth decile, then again, we locate its position first. It is n plus 1, and our n is 12, so we have 12 plus 1 multiplied by 90 divided by 100. It will give you 11.7. It means that our 90th percentile is located 70% um, of the distance between the 11th and 12th observation because it's 11.7 right so we compute that our 11th observation is 95 plus 0 0.7 times the distance between 11th and the 12th which is 9 minus because the 12 is 96 it gives us 95.7 so in the interpretation is that 90 percent of observations are less than 95.7 and then 10 percent are more than 95.7 now, what we've just illustrated is for ungrouped data, com computing percentiles, quartiles, and deciles. But when it comes to group data, we can apply this formula. For example, if we want the 25th percentile, we use this formula. Now, 
the 25th percentile is the same as um, the first quartile, right? So we can write it as Q1. So it is equal to L plus N divided by 4 minus CF, all divided by F times I, where R L is the lower limit of the class containing the 25th percentile or the first quartile. CF is the cumulative frequency preceding the class containing the first quartile. F is the frequency of the class containing the first quartile. And then I is the size of the class containing the first quartile. Similarly, when we're using the 75th percentile, then we'll write this is, does not become N over 4. The N over 4 can be written as 1 over 4 times N, right? But because 1 over 4 is quarter, first quarter. But this is the third quartile, so 3 over 4 times N. And the, the other variables as, as previously described, but in this case, they are related to the third quartile. So this is how you do it. We can generalize the formula for any percentile. So, if we want the pth percentile, then it is L plus Pn over 100 minus Cf, all divided by F times I. Where this R P here is the percentile we want to calculate. So, it's, if it is the 70th percentile, then that value becomes 70. Then your N is the number of observations. Your L is the lower limit of the class containing the percentile we want to compute. So if it is the 70th percentile, it is the class containing the 70th percentile. CF, as usual, is a cumulative frequency preceding the class containing the 70th percentile or whichever percentile we want to compute. And then F is the frequency of the class containing the percentile. And then I is the size of the class containing the percentile. So when you work out, all that you need to do is to know the formula and identify the variables to slot into it. Once you compute these things, you can compute differences between them. One important measure of dispersion is to use what we call the interquartile range, which is simply the difference between the third and the first quartiles. And then you can also compute percentile ranges. So it looks at the difference between two percentiles. For example, one common one is to look at the 10 to 90th percentile range, which is the difference between the 90th percentile and the 10th percentile. Let's wrap up our discussion by discussing skewness. You know, sometimes in some data, you might see some very large values all grouped together or very small values grouped together. Basically, when we talk about skewness, we're talking about the lack of symmetry in the data. If one or more observations of a distribution are extremely large, what it will do is to make the mean bigger or greater than the median and the mode. When that happens, we say that the distribution is positively skewed, or you can say it is right skewed. On the other hand, when the data contains a lot of extremely small values, then we say that the mean becomes smaller than the median and the mode, and therefore the data is said to be negatively skewed or left skewed. And it is also possible to compute the coefficient of skewness to, to indicate whether it is left skewed or it is right skewed, or to say there's no skewness at all. So the skewness coefficient is calculated using this formula, 3 multipl uh, multiplied by into brackets the mean minus the median, or divided by the standard deviation, as you can see. So to use a graph to illustrate, a distribution that is not skewed or is said to be symmetric is one in which the mode value is equal to the median value and is equal to the mean. In that case, the distribution is such that the left half is the exact mirror image of the right half. Okay, so 
Being here is like you are seeing yourself in the mirror. Okay, so it's like looking at yourself in the mirror. So the left half here is the exact mirror image of the right. So it means that 50% of the distributions are to the right, 50 to the left, and in very good proportion. But this is a case of um, positively skewed. It means that the curve is such that it has a long tail to the right, right? And in that case, the mean is greater than the median, which in turn is greater than the mode. So this is the mean, which is greater, and this is the median, and this is the mode. We say it is positively or right skewed. And then, for the left skewed, it means that the mean is less than the median, and the median in turn is less than the mode, which means that distribution has a long tail in the left. Okay, so this is what we say as being negatively skewed. And it is important, it is possible to describe this in some data sets because the, a few observations might be extremely large blowing up the mean when the majority are low. So this is an example which will excite you. Now the question says that the length of stay on the cancer floor of Kolebu Hospital were organized into a frequency distribution. The mean length of stay is 28 days, the median is 25 days, and the modal length is 23 days. Now the standard deviation was computed to be 42 days. Is the distribution symmetrical, positively skewed, or negatively skewed? Calculate the coefficient of skewness and interpret it. So this is a potential exam question, right? Now note that this, this part, statistics being applied to health, right? So this thing is also done in health. Now to solve this problem, we can say clearly that it is positively skewed because we know the mean is greater than the other two. We said earlier that it's positively skewed when the mean is the greatest. But to calculate that coefficient, we apply the formula, which is 3 into brackets, mean minus median, bracket close, all divided by standard deviation. It gives us 2.14. In principle, we expect the coefficient of skewness to range between minus 3 and positive 3. Okay? Now, we have a value which is 2.14, very close to the maximum. So it indicates that we might have some kind of a substantial amount of skewness in the data. And what it means is that there are just one or two, a few patients who are staying for a very long period, which has blown up the av average to indicate that people are staying very long. Okay, so these people can be said to be outliers, right, in the data set. So uh, my fellow students, I hope you've enjoyed this session. This is where we bring it to an end. We will see you again in the next session, this, um, session four, where we will discuss probability theory. Thank you very much.